All right, my assistant, Ms. Wonkar, has the uh, handouts for you. Um, I will say, as we're, as we're getting started today, that um, keep in mind as we're going through this that the Christmas season is, um, uh, is one of the most joyful times of the year, right? But it is also one of the seasons of the year that people battle depression more than any other. In fact, the, the suicide rates at Christmas time and in the Christmas season are higher than any other time of the year, um, which just speaks to the issues that people are dealing with so many times this, uh, during, during this season. So I want to encourage you, uh, maybe you look at some of the things that we're talking about and you're thinking this, this has no application to my life. Um, it could be that God is going to use you during this season just to be able to love on someone uh, who's going through something that is deep or dark in their, in their own life. And uh, maybe there's something that you can share with them based on what we're talking about that can just help them and, and be a lift, uh, a lift to them. So um, I want to encourage you to process this, this information in that light and, and uh, yeah, to just pass it on to, to someone this, this Christmas season. Uh, we talked about last week how to get depressed. Um, and, and let me just say that uh, um, many, of these, many of these points uh, from both last week and this week, certainly not the, the stories, but many of, many of the points come from a message that I heard by Pastor Craig Groeschel. Uh, and so let me just, I want to give him a little credit for, for some of these. Um, but I just think this is, this is really powerful. Uh, well, last week we talked about how to get depressed, wear yourself out. Uh, people, people who just uh, work, 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 uh, and just give themselves out, give themselves out, give themselves out, uh, find themselves easily being depressed, shutting people out of your life. That should be a huge red flag for us whenever we have friends or people in our, in our life that we're close to and all of a sudden they sort of hit the skids on, on the relationships that they have with us or maybe other close friends and you see them withdraw. Uh, that should be a sign to, to us in our own life, wait a minute, I'm withdrawing from the people that love me the most or that person is withdrawing from the people that love them the most should be a sign for us that, uh, that, that there is the possibility of, of depression. Uh, when, when people begin to focus on the negative, uh, so maybe you see a person that was at one time joyful and, and walked around and, and had a positive outlook on things and had a lot of hope and dreams, and, and now all they do is talk about the negative, the negative. Anything that happens, they focus on the negative parts of it. When they're talking about other people, they're always focusing on the negative things they see in other people. Uh, that's a sign of depression. And, and most of all, when they begin to forget about God and His promises in their life and what He's done for them in the past, um, it, is, it is a sign that depression is, is, is close. Um, we, we pick up with Elijah um, uh, in in. 1 Kings 19, and I, I, I want to start this by reading the first few verses of, of chapter 19, because Elijah had come off of one of the most incredible victories that we read about in all of the Bible, right? When he's on the Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal and sees God send down fire from heaven, I mean, all of us are impressed by this miracle and this display of faith in God and the power of God on Mount Carmel is just an amazing and miraculous story. And, and you would think in this moment that when, when Elijah sees this great miracle and is used by God to perform this great miracle, you would think now he is riding a spiritual high and nothing could, nothing could take him out. Uh, nothing, nothing could hinder his faith at this point. Nothing uh, could, could get him down. But we find the opposite of that is, is true. And, and I think it's important for all of us to note that 
that sometimes some of the greatest setups for depression is, is not defeats, but some of the greatest setup for depression is actually great victories, right? Because we can experience a great victory, we can experience some positive thing in our life, and, 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 and we're just on, we're on top of the world, um, and, and it's like, at that point, uh, I, I believe the enemy starts really fighting against us to get our mind off of the victory of God. Um, and, and so many times we find that, that people struggle most after their, their, greatest, their greatest victory. Uh, so Elijah sees this great miracle on Mount Carmel. Then the very next verses in, in chapter 19, check this out, Ahab... Who, who, had, who had sort of a first-hand account of this, of this miracle, told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. Uh, so you go from this amazing moment to... You're going to die by tomorrow. Uh, what does Elijah do? You're, you're thinking, I, I know what you're thinking before you read ahead. You're thinking, I know what he does. He stands up and he says, But Jezebel, did you not see that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob took out your prophets on Mount Carmel? And you will surely be as one of those. That's not what he said. Elijah became afraid. Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. He was scared. I mean, you would think he just, he just faced down these prophets of Baal, hundreds, hundreds. And now this one lady, uh, granted, she was a mean one, right? This one woman and her... her uh, threat towards him causes him to run for his life in fear, as if the God who was big enough to take care of him on Mount Carmel was no longer big enough to sustain him and to take care of him. And Elijah becomes severely depressed. Again, like when we saw him by the brook, we see he's running for his life. He's fearful. And, and I believe what we see next in 1 Kings 19 is just a prescription uh, for how we can overcome depression in our life and how we see God lift Elijah out of, this, out of this fear, out of this anxiety, and out of this depression that he was in. The first thing, the first thing in, in your notes there, and I love this, uh, the first thing that we see God do for Elijah in this moment is, is He tells him, go eat and rest. Don't you love it how God brings food into the equation so many times, Right? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I love that. Um, here, here's, here's the reality. Elijah was in a place of hopelessness. Um, and he was in a place of, of extreme fear. And, and God didn't appear to him and rebuke him. God didn't uh, appear to him and chastise him for his lack of faith in this moment. God didn't appear to him and, and come down hard on him and say, you believed in me yesterday with all these prophets around and now you're, you're shriveling up in fear. What is going on, Elijah? He didn't, he didn't appear to him and rebuke him or chastise him uh, in any way. Um, he merely comforts him and says, hey, Elijah, get up, eat, and rest. All at once, verse 5 says, the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and he laid down again. Let me just say that I, I, I know especially this time of the year, probably you know, all of us feel like you're just... Uh, you're at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to energy, when it comes to just uh, uh, 
desire maybe, and you know you're running on fumes in a lot of ways. Um, and, and, and I think Bice is full of, of people who just go, 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 go. And, and in some ways, that's awesome. But, but I, I think that probably one of the most broken commandments is the commandment that God has given each of us to rest. And, and I think one of the most spiritual things that some of you could do in your life right now is just to find yourself in a true Sabbath of rest. Right? Where, 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 you, where you say, you know what, I realize, just like Jesus, because He was sort of a good role model, yeah? Who, who, who understood that if He was available all of the time, He was fully available none of the time. That's why Jesus had to say at times, I, I've got to get away from people and get to the other side of the lake and have some me time. Because if you're fully available, or if you're available all of the time, you're really not fully available any of the time. Right? You've got to take time to rest. You've got to take time to replenish yourself. And Elijah had come off of a busy season of ministry where he was going, going, going. He had stood and faced down these prophets on, on Mount Carmel. And God was saying to him, okay, Elijah, it's time to rest up. It's time to take care of you. When you find yourself falling into depressive thoughts, falling into to neg negative thoughts, one of the most spiritual things that you can do is just take some you time and get alone with the Lord and eat and rest. In fact, God, God, told, uh, God told Elijah uh, after, he, after he got up in verses 7 and 8, uh, now, now go... Uh, go right to, to Mount Horeb, which was where a lot of scholars believe that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. So he said, hey, eat, rest, and go get with God. Go where you can get with God and just be with Him. Um, so I, I think what a challenging word for us to just allow ourselves to rest in, in Him. Secondly, God, God replaced Elijah's lies with truth. Uh, look at verses 9 and 10. The Scripture says that uh, Elijah went into a cave um, and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, uh, let's, let's just pause there for a moment and all acknowledge, just like when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and, and God was like, Where are you? God really knew what Elijah was doing there. Like, God wasn't asking this question as if Elijah was going to be able to give him some great revelation, right? God, God knew. I, I, think, I think that God was asking him because he wanted, to, he wanted for Elijah to hear Elijah verbalize where he was at. Um, and I think sometimes God does that to us, right? And, and so listen, listen to this. Um, here's what Elijah said. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. That's a true statement. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. That's a true statement. They have broken down your altars. That's a true statement. And put your prophets to death with the sword. That's a true statement. But then listen to the falsehoods that Elijah gets in. I am the only one left. Now they are trying to kill me too. False. I am the only one left. False. I've been doing all this work by myself. I've been doing all this work. False. I am the only one who cares. I am the only one who can get it done. And, and Elijah's just making these false statements that to him feel real, but, but they really, uh, they're, they're totally, totally false. And, and he's basically saying, God, there's no one that cares like me. Everybody's depending on me. I'm here all alone. And God comes back in the verses to, to follow and He reminds Elijah, Elijah, you're not alone. There are 7,000 other people here in this country who love me and are passionate about me. They didn't stand on Mount Carmel, but they are dedicated to me, Elijah, and they have your back here. And God reminds Elijah, you're not alone. 
when we are in our lowest, I, I, I believe that we begin to subscribe to lies that have no basis in truth, right? And God has a way of reminding us, you think you're all alone. You think that no one cares. But I put people around you who love you and who care for you and who are there for you if you will let them be. God replaces our lies with His truth. And third, God speaks to us in a still, small voice. Um, you have to remember that Elijah, Elijah had experienced some pretty amazing miracles that were, that were sort of loud miracles, right? Fire coming down from heaven. He saw God show up in big, big ways. But I love, I love 1 Kings 19, uh, verse 11 and 12. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper came a gentle whisper. Sometimes when we are at our lowest, the Lord speaks the softest. So it would seem, right? Um, like, it's not in these grand, miraculous ways, but it's always enough. His still, small voice gives us the peace that we need to carry on for another day. Like, His guiding hand leads us one more step so we can make it uh, through one more, one more day. Um, if you listen, if you listen to God, I, I believe in your lowest moments, you will hear Him say, you are not alone. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am, I am here. Um, let me move quickly. Fourth, God, in your times that you are low, when you find yourself close to depression or in depression, I believe God will give you something to do. Uh, in verses 15 and 16, God said, Go back the way you came and go over to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram, and anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah uh, to succeed you as, as prophet. In other words, Go back, Elijah, and do what prophets do. Go back and do what prophets do. This is, this is one of the hardest things to do, by the way. Okay, Elijah, eat and get some rest. Okay, Elijah, replace the, the lies in your head with the truth of my word. And then, hey, Elijah, get up and do something. Get up and do something. You don't feel like getting up and doing something. But get up and do something. Like, something. And, 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 Eli, and, and God listed all of these things that, that a prophet of God should be, should be doing. Uh, and he said, go, go do this. Um, think, about this think about this for a moment. And I'm, I'm moving, moving quickly here. But I, I want to make sure you get this, this, final, this final piece of the puzzle. Because this hit me really hard when I was reading, uh, reading the Scripture this week. Um, think about this for a moment. Elijah was at a very low time. And I think the first, the first few verses sort of tell us what he was most afraid of and what had depressed him in this, in this moment. Um, Jezebel said, you're going to become like one of these prophets that you slaughtered with the sword. You're going to die, Elijah. Elijah in fear bought into this and ran for his life. But listen, listen to this, this, this verse in 2 Kings. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. The thing that Elijah was most afraid of, the thing that brought the most depressive thoughts to him, really had no basis in reality. Like he never even experienced what he was so afraid of. 
And most of the time, most of the time when we find ourselves depressed or living in anxiety or fear, so many times the things that we are most scared of will never even happen. It's like what what David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadows aren't real, right? They're just a reflection of something else, right? They're not even real. A shadow's not going to jump out at you and attack you, right? And, and, And most of the time, the things we fear the most never even come to pass. And we spend so much time, so much time and so much energy and so much of our well-being just just scared over these things. And I believe that in those moments that if we will allow God to, He will come in and replace lies with truth. He will come in and give our soul rest and replenish us to help us to fight another day. I want to encourage you, wherever you're at right now, let your strength be found in the Lord. You might have been through some tough stuff. Some hard stuff. Eat and rest and be replenished in the Lord. It doesn't mean that the road is going to be easy ahead of you, but if Elijah Elijah teaches us anything, he teaches us God still has something for you. As one person told me, don't die until you're dead, right? God's got something for you. Get up every day. Be replenished in the Lord. Let His truth win out over the, the lies that, are try, that Satan will try to confront you with. And go be the best you that you can possibly be. Let me, let me pray for you. God, we love you and we thank you so much for your word, for reminding us that we are people just like Elijah. And God, we find ourselves in low moments just like he did. Help us, Lord. Help us to be encouraged in our faith and to rise above Uh, any depressive thoughts or anxiety that we might feel. We love you and thank you for it in your strong name.